Welcome to the FinTech One-on-One Podcast. This is Peter Renton, Chairman and Co-Founder of FinTech Nexus. I've been doing these shows since 2013, which makes this the longest-running one-on-one interview show in all of FinTech. Thank you for joining me on this journey. If you like this podcast, you should check out our sister shows, Pitch It, the FinTech Startups Podcast with Todd Anderson, and FinTech Coffee Break with Isabel Castro. Or you can listen to everything we produce by subscribing to the FinTech Nexus podcast channel. Before we get started, I want to talk about our flagship event, FinTech Nexus USA, happening in New York City on May 10th and 11th. The world of finance continues to change at a rapid pace, but we will be separating the wheat from the chaff, covering only the most important topics for you over two action-packed days. More than 10,000 one-on-one meetings will take place, and the biggest names in fintech will be on our keynote stage. You know you need to be there, so go ahead and register at fintechnexus.com and use the discount code PODCAST for 15% off. Today on the show, I am delighted to welcome Blair Silverberg. He is the founder and CEO of Hum Capital. Now, Hum Capital is a really interesting company. They have created something unique. And what they've done is basically created a capital markets platform for middle market lending that also can work for equity, as he says, but it's basically a data-driven platform where you have companies that are looking to borrow money in the $1 to $50 million range with uh, investors looking to deploy capital. And he has made this, they say they're a matchmaker, but they've done it all with data. And we'll get into this in some depth. We talk about the types of data they use, why it's important to really have a data-driven marketplace. And he's got some, some lofty goals, which he also get into, and talking about how that basically capital fundraising is broken and it's extremely inefficient. And what Hum Capital provides is a repeatable, efficient way for companies to raise capital. It was a fascinating discussion. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Blair. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. So let's kick it off uh, by giving the listeners a little bit of background about yourself. Just tell us some some of the high points in your career to date. My career, I guess, technically started when I was six. And I, <laughs> you were earning money when you were six, were you? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't exploited by my parents. However, my grandmother gave me Beanie Babies back in the, I guess we could call it like the early 90s as eBay was getting going. And when you could sell these things for like $4,000, if they had a name tag that had the wrong name on them, they were kind of like the old, old NFTs. Right. <laughs> and so... I sold some of these on eBay with the help of my mother and accumulated some capital. And as a six-year-old, like my parents weren't going to let me spend the capital on anything exciting. So I was going to sit in a bank account and do nothing. Or at my, my father's urging, I could learn how to invest it. And so I actually got into investing really early in my life. And I'd say by the time I was 12 or 13, when I had my bar mitzvah, I was like, I was like actually investing in the stock market, reading every book I could find on the topic. And that started a passion for investing, which is really like, from my perspective, a way to understand the world. So kind of like a a passion for learning about how the world works at a very young age. Interesting. Interesting. And so then what were you doing before you started Hum Capital? I was a venture capitalist at a firm called Draper Fisher Jurvetson. And Steve Jurvetson, who's, who's one of the founders of that firm, is my largest investor now at Hum. And so I worked very closely with him and, you know, he basically taught me venture capital because I, I knew a lot about investing and macroeconomics and public markets from my, my childhood interests. But, you know, I went to Stanford for college. Venture and tech is an enormous part of that community. And I knew very little about it. And so I was, I was super lucky to get paired up with Steve uh, at the very beginning of my career. That is a, a great firm to sort of learn the industry in. So then tell us a little bit about the founding story of, of Hum Capital. What was a what was the problem you saw that you were looking to address? There's like the long term, like I've been thinking about some of these things since I was a kid, and then there's the shorter term. I saw a very discreet opportunity, so I can give you both. But sure. you know, the shorter term 
picture was I was I was sitting at DFJ. We were invested in a bunch of companies like Prosper, a bunch of fintech companies. Mm-hmm. I didn't see anybody offering a reinvention of like middle market lending or larger transactions. And I kind of saw that most of these companies that would go to you know a venture debt firm or commercial bank and raise ten to fifty million dollars were using cloud systems. So like QuickBooks or NetSuite for accounting, payment processors like Chase Payment Tech or Stripe. And it seemed to me there was a pretty straightforward opportunity to connect into those systems, analyze data, make much more quantitative decisions about how a business was doing. And I thought if somebody would build something like this, it could be a great business. It could be kind of the beginning of like a private market exchange or Goldman 2.0. But it also could have tremendous impact because it would introduce transparency like real data-driven transparency into this part of the market where, for the most part, as an entrepreneur, you get funded if you know the right people and you don't if you don't. Mm -hmm. And I saw that firsthand as a VC. You know, I would meet like 2,000 entrepreneurs a year. I was young. I had a ton of energy. Like I was out there all the time meeting everybody I possibly could. And I just saw a huge gulf between the, the underlying economics in a business, which is what should drive the interest that society has in allocating its capital to a business versus why companies were actually getting funded. And I basically thought if we could solve that problem, we could build a great business, but we could also, if you really take it to its logical conclusion, we could build something that focuses on making society allocate its capital better. And that's effectively the thing you have to do as a society to grow wealth per person, make all the good things that are happening in the world happen faster. And like, no one's really working on that problem. No one's Mm -hmm. being rigorous about how society allocates their capital. And so we kind of took that mantle and went forward and started home. Okay. So then how does it work exactly? Why don't you take us through, you know, both sides of the platform, shall we say? Obviously you have the the company seeking capital, but you've got to have capital providers on the other side. Tell us how it works. I can give you a bunch of customer examples, but that's probably the best way to understand the business. So you know, just one off the top of my head, there's a company called P97, which is based in Houston. And they're a business that that are basically um, self-funded by the founder and some early kind of friends and family and, and investors. And they were able to create this payment processor for gas stations. And it's like not the sexiest business on the surface. You know, I, I don't know if they ever tried to approach VCs, but like if I was at DFJ looking at something like this, I would be like, yeah, it's not, not probably not the, the sexiest thing I'm going to back. Mm-hmm. Turns out the economics are unbelievable. Like just absolutely fantastic business. And so... As this business has been growing, you know, they came to, to Hum initially because they needed some working capital. And so we helped them raise something in the order of like $3 million from a fintech lender, actually. And then as the business grew, they started ramping the different gas station clients that they have because they, they basically sign deals with major company, major oil companies like Shell. And then they go out and they do a rollout with each individual gas station. So there's kind of this really interesting, like, you get a whale and then you have the you've paved the way to grow the business enormously based off of that contract. It's just a matter of time and rollout. So anyway, they they had financial needs that got much more sophisticated and they were growing so rapidly. This happened like something like six or nine months after they initially raised capital and hum. And so, you know, we're constantly with our, our software monitoring their data, seeing the business improve, proactively paying them with things like, hey, you may want to refinance this thing you just got in your balance sheet because like, yes, you just took it out, but also the business is so much more eligible for lower cost capital, you may want to just basically click a button to make that happen. And so they did like six to nine months into their the life of their first transaction uh, on HUM, refinanced with a private credit fund called Peak Rock, um, which is just a fantastic, fantastic investor, raised something like $40 million. And they've just been off to the races, you know, building a fantastic business. And you think about that life cycle, there's like two things that they were able to benefit from that's very different than how private market capital raising typically works. Like one is totally fluid variety of capital. So, you know, they connected their data and just got to choose from a menu of what capital makes sense to them. They didn't have to do a lot of work to go chase down different options. And two, like ever better terms as they got better as a business. So they didn't have to sit and pay more for their cost of capital than the business deserved. As soon as the business was eligible for better financing, they clicked a button and they got it. And that's really the future of how funding should work. Like the concept of a funding round, businesses make progress every day. It makes no sense that there's a funding round, a funding process. And the fact that there's the SaaS data now available to 
help investors make very clear data-driven decisions is the key thing that enables this new kind of streaming financing kind of model. So then there's your platform. You, you talked about how it went. They had one investor, then they refinanced, they had another investor. So are you doing a matchmaking service or is it more sort of a data-driven thing where the investor has like a credit box that they, they're interested in and then you sort of say, here's this one in the box, in your wheelhouse. Is there automation or how does it actually work? So you think of it exactly like you described. So there's a credit box and investors can program really specific boxes, like hundreds and hundreds of variables. Like, I mean, I'll tell you crazy things we've seen, like, you know, a bunch of thresholds around customer diversity. Customer diversification is accelerating, you know, probably 50 ways to think about revenue growth. So you can get hyper granular mm. and even, even push into codifying things quantitatively that most investors, if you talk to them today, would say are qualitative which is a whole other topic we can talk about, like how quant funds developed in the public markets and how this is coming to privates and why a bunch of things that are obviously not qualitative in the in the modern day and the public markets are still thought of as qualitative in the private markets. So we can come back to that. But essentially, we have people who who program extremely thoughtful quantitative techniques into the system. And then on the flip side, we have a whole community of investors that say, hey, I want to run some basic rules like gross margin greater than X, revenue growth greater than Y, certain amount of runway, you know, outstanding in the business. Show me every company that looks like that that wants to meet me. And so it's a highly data-driven, basically matchmaking service, exactly like you said. And, you know, we we basically take no view on like qualitative factors in the business. It's all about just like if a company has good data, match them to people who we know will quantitatively back that business. And then as a company, you meet investors who you know, have done deals like this. There's no mystery. It's like, would this person fund me? It's like, yeah, like (laughs) they programmed in the criteria. They will fund people exactly like you. They do that all the time. So it takes a lot of the mystery out of meeting investors and um, it just creates a ton of efficiency. So then the investors must trust your your platform, right? Because I imagine, well, maybe you can just give us a sense. An investor sees something that's in their wheelhouse do then do they go through this month long due diligence process then with the platform they're going to invest in or or do they just say oh this is inside our credit box all the data is correct here's the cash some investors are totally passive exactly like you described and some investors basically run their same process they just use our data and tools so they don't have to ask the company hey can you do a cohort analysis that answers you know this particular question the system spits out all of that stuff to them so they're basically speeding up their existing process by both sides avoiding a bunch of manual data analysis they'd otherwise have to do. But we we kind of meet investors where they are. So like a commercial bank that has a regulated credit process sticks with its existing process, zero changes. They can just take our data as a starting point. Mm-hmm. And then there's other investors who I'm thinking like like some of our life insurance customers who are very used to buying ETFs in the public markets. Right. There is no ETF equivalent in the private markets, no index fund. So they have that need. They're like, hey, I kind of know what all these private credit funds I'm in are doing. They're charging me really high fees. It'd be awesome to replicate some of their strategies passively. Can you do that for me? And so we we kind of meet that need all the time. So then are you doing, is it primarily debt or is there a mix of debt and equity on your platform? So today we're very debt focused. Um, there's nothing in the system that is exclusively, like only works for debt. It just, you know, private credit's growing very quickly. The cost of capital in private credit is is a lot lower than equity in general. Right. There's a lot of appetite for it. It's underutilized by companies. Some of the best companies have, when you start looking at the private credit options available to them versus like a, a maybe a very sexy venture financing, you get to some math that makes it a no-brainer to take out private credit. So we've, we've really liked focusing there initially, but... We do all sorts of stuff just very quietly around equity. It totally works. Like same systems work for equity. Yeah, I was thinking the same. And it's all when you've got all this data, it's I mean, obviously debt's a less complicated transaction. So it's got that going for it. You know, I imagine it's a little bit quicker, but so then like obviously you don't have to be a venture back company, obviously. You could kind of be just a main street American company. But obviously you don't you're not dealing with two hundred and fifty thousand dollar loans here. What is the range of deal sizes and where's it fitting on an average? So one to $50 million is kind of the archetype you should think of. So exactly like you said, bigger than small business lending, there are 
a plethora of a way a ways to get a two hundred fifty thousand dollar loan. Once you get to one million, you're dealing with so- sophisticated institutional capital, and that's where things get a little bit more complicated. And then as you grow that size up to call it fifty, you you start bumping in in larger deal sizes against like Goldman Sachs, right? Or Cowan and Company is one of our investors, and um, you know they'll tell you things like the the investment banking business is a percentage of transaction fee model. Mm-hmm. So the smaller the deal, harder it is to make money with people. Most of these guys like transactions greater than some threshold. And so what that means for companies is you're basically totally on your own in this no man's land <laughs> between one and 50 million. And um, in some ways, investors have kind of tried to train the community. That's normal. Like we don't like banked transactions. You know, we don't like intermediaries. Like, yeah, that's because that that means better terms for investors. Right. <laughs> it's not good for companies. So we are that intermediary. It's just that, you know, to be an intermediary of this this size of transaction, you just have to heavily rely on automation and technology and data. So that's why when you ask what kind of business we are, like sometimes I describe the business, oh, it's like Goldman 2.0. Other times I describe the business, oh, it's NASDAQ for private market transactions. It's honestly, it's a little bit of both. Right. But, you know, others I've spoken to in this space, and it's not, there's not many players, um, really, particularly when if it was a fintech angle, a lot of it says it's very much a relationship based business. So, like where the relationships with investors, relationships with the brokers, or whatever, who are bringing deals, sourcing deal flow is a really important piece, right? How have you taken the relationship out of that? I have to give credit to Peter Thiel to this one. So there's a point early in my career when I was going to go go work with Peter Thiel, and I'm, I'm a, a big fan of his. He has this notion that the best business ideas come from when you see something that the market doesn't see. So you kind of know a secret that nobody else, else knows. But markets are really competitive. Mm-hmm. So no one actually knows a secret that nobody else knows. There's always like 10 or 15 or 20 people who know the same thing. And I saw this when I was a VC. There would be like the craziest technology. You're like, oh my God, how did you think of this? There's like 20 companies doing the same thing. <laughs> so the, play, the place secrets actually come from is you have conviction around some concept that the market has an incentive to tell the world is, is false. Right. And relationships in investing are exactly this concept. Mm-hmm. So whether it's a bank, or whether it's a private market investor, their edge, their their alpha, if it's based in relationships, it's really opaque, really hard to understand. And who are you to say, that bank doesn't actually have a big relationship advantage with its clients. So it's almost the perfect narrative to create to describe why your business is protected and it will never be disrupted. The problem is it is completely false <laughs> in the classic Peter Thiel style. And you can run a sim, a super simple thought experiment. So if you take like your typical VC who may sit on a board and say, hey, we're the ultimate relationship business, the venture capital business. Now, when one of their companies wants to raise venture debt, what's the first thing they say? Do you have multiple term sheets? If not, please go get some. Right. When those multiple term sheets come in, the last thing you're ever going to hear from a venture-backed board is take the more expensive one because I love the banker there. <laughs> so fundamentally... If let's say commercial credit, there's whatever the number is, 17 or $20 trillion of US commercial credit um, outstanding right now. If commercial credit is not actually relationship-based, then why would we think the rest of private market investing is somehow, for some strange reason, relationship-based? So I think it's just going to be a matter of time that the relationship narrative starts to change and you know entrepreneurs and investors get more focused on kind of like they do in the public markets, like good decision-making, good data, really good insight. And imagine if people spend all their time trying to figure out, hey, how do I finance optimally this company that's doing this really crazy, interesting thing? That's applying brain power to solve a real financing problem versus, hey, how do I take this person out to a box at the you know, 49ers game 50 times and so they, so they ultimately transact with me? It's way better for society, for smart people to be figuring out how to finance clever things cool. than to just taking people to, uh, to 49ers games. <laughs> Indeed. So, but with that, I still am curious about sourcing deals from like people who are looking to raise capital. How are you doing that? Do you work with brokers or do you just, is it more of a, an online promotional play? Yeah, it's, it's an online, almost like a freemium model. So it's surprisingly unsophisticated and straightforward. <laughs> you know, you put up a website and you say, hey, 
if you're thinking about raising capital, we will tell you for free exactly what an investor is going to say about your business behind closed doors. When you put up that pitch, people just, they show up. Right. <laughs> they want to know. <laughs> These are secrets. They're closely guarded secrets that investors try to hold from the market. And um, we tell them all, more or less. Now, we don't tell underlying investor strategies. There's a bunch of things that are like highly sensitive, highly specific to clients on HUM. But the general lessons, like how should I measure sales and marketing efficiency? We tell you exactly how smart investors think about that. And so that's all free. You get all of that when you come to HUM and you know plug in some data and start to, to basically build out your account. And then the place that we make money is when companies actually want to transact with an investor. So we earn a fee when they successfully transact. And that's the entirety of the business model today. It's basically a success base, almost like an exchange-like fee. Right. So I want to switch to more to the data side. And you, you've talked about a little bit, but and businesses have lots of data. I mean, there's there's payments processing, there's payroll, there's the accounting data, um, shipping data, could be Amazon, whatever. What kinds of data are you working with? There's 20 types, including every category that you mentioned. And the amount that we suck in has a lot to do with what the business is trying to get financed. So the simplest case is, hey, I want to loan at one times EBITDA. We basically need two things to do that. The income statement, and then a connection to either the bank accounts or the payment processors because we audit and validate that the income statement has not been doctored. Mm -hmm. We do that automatically in the system. All of our investors rely on us to do that comparison across the system so that we know the data is real. That's the simplest case. More complicated cases can be things like, hey, I think I have a really repeatable sales pipeline and I want to take out financing against it. I've got you know, 200,000 leads. I have a history of converting them at a predictable rate. We actually have almost like asset-based financing that investors on the platform have done based off of Salesforce data. Like hmm. net new, brand new product doesn't exist in the market, but we need Salesforce data for it. So we kind of you know, take this approach that we ask for the data that is critical to making an investment decision based off of what you're trying to do. And what's beautiful about this is if you think about the amount of like manual effort that investment firms, consultants who help them, and then the auditors spin trying to run to ground what's actually going on in the business, what they're basically doing is like manually logging in, usually with management's help, to the systems that management's using to run a business anyway. So the data is all online. We just grab it, you know, organize it, analyze it in a streamlined fashion, effectively replacing what, what humans already have to spend a lot of time doing anyway to make these transactions happen. And so if a, a business owner comes to you and says, you know, I, I need like $5 million and I mean, they want obviously the best deal, right? But there's obviously lots of different products you know, as you said, there's asset-based financing, you know, term loans. You could do like a merchant cash advance type product with a future kind of receivables. You know, they could back by real estate. How do you point them into the the best deal? And are these mainly term loans that you're that you're doing? Or tell us a little about the products. Yeah, I mean, they're super varied. So there's probably 20 or 30 different structures that commonly pop up in the marketplace. And I can go into some of the categories in more detail. But I think that the important point is that, let's say you get five options, which is the average number of options that companies on home get. And they're all different. One's a you know short-term factor. One's a MCA. One's a term loan with no warrants. The other one's a term loan with warrants, but a lower interest rate. So you have all these structures. Investors spend their whole you know, careers, day in and day out, refining and tweaking structures. Mm -hmm. So it's fundamentally a very asymmetric game. Right. So when you're consuming these five options, you're like, what do they mean? And you often <laughs> right. don't know. So you just described there, like the cost of those is very, very difficult to calculate. Very difficult to calculate. Yeah. yeah so, so the key is transforming those five totally different options with bells and whistles and nooks and crannies and all sorts of things into the simplest possible way to compare them. And essentially, the way we do that is we show just two factors. One is, if I take this option versus this option, how much is the my personal value of my current stake in my business going to be worth at exit? You can set your own exit you know, value five years from now, some price or whatever. Like, How, how much more money am I going to make with option A versus option B? That's the upside. And then the second metric we use is the downside. Hey, if things get bad in my business, how bad do they have to get before I'm in trouble? Mm -hmm. And we find with those two metrics alone, 
you can really bring a clear-eyed comparison to anything you may you may see in the market. Now, the work behind the scenes to actually make them accurate and say, hey, in option A, your stake's going to be worth $12.4 million, entrepreneur, but in option B, your stake's going to be worth $17.6 million. That is where a lot of analytics and <laughs> systems come into play. But for an entrepreneur to just look at options in that way, like how much am I going to get? And then basically by what percentage can my revenue, can my average revenue decline before I'm in trouble if I take option B versus option A? It really simplifies the analysis um, and it focuses people on what matters. And so often in choosing financing, you're focused on what doesn't matter. Like mm-hmm. what is the headline interest rate? It's like, well, if there's a discount and an OID, uh, basically an origination discount, if there's an upfront fee, if there's a make whole, if there's warrants, if there's multiple tiers of warrants, you know, that can get really confusing. So mm-hmm. we just try to keep that super, super simple. Interesting. Interesting. So then I'm curious about the whole idea of bias. And, you know, it sounds like what you're basically creating is a database fundraising system that has by its really, by the way it's been created, doesn't have the bias that the old system has. I mean, how do you think about that? Yeah, that's the goal. Like one of one of our core kind of cultural premises is like remove all bias from finance, mm-hmm. period. That's the goal. Now, in reality, uh, there's still a lot of bias in the system. There's not bias in the data, but like, how did the data get that way in the first place? So do people who are like highly educated and have a bunch of personal capital to put into the first round of their business, and they just have a lot more time and, you know, capability to get something off the ground than others? Do those people have an advantage? Like, absolutely. Is that fair? No. You know, who needs to fix that? Like a combination of us making these things visible quantitatively and society figuring out how do you really give people more of an even playing field. So that kind of bias exists, but the kind of bias that goes away immediately, like for every one of the, the customers we've transacted, we've done, I don't know what number we announced publicly, but it's it's on the order of a billion dollars of transactions since we were were founded. The kinds of bias that goes away immediately are, you know, it doesn't really matter who you know. We have investors passively making investments. They don't even need to meet you in some cases. It doesn't matter, therefore, what you look like. It doesn't really matter like if you're from the industry or not, or you can tell a good story because the proof is in your performance. So a lot of the traditional sources of bias, which make great talents feel stifled if they don't, just don't connect to the investment community well, are gone. And that's really a powerful thing. Right. Now, that has tremendous potential um, for sure. So then, you know, we're recording this in you know mid-January of 2023 and people are the smart economists in the world think we might have a recession this year. How are you thinking about that when, you know, obviously you're you're a platform, you're a marketplace in, in reality, but you want to have all these deals be successful. How have sort of changing economic circumstances impacted the way you guys operate? Yeah, I mean, that's that's really interesting because you generally just have things shifting around, but it's really hard to know what's what's happening. So like, I rarely watch CNBC, but earlier I was watching the CNBC anchors talk a lot about Discover Card, I guess, come, came out with um, higher than expected losses. And so the question is like, to today, the question is like, oh no, what's going to happen to the consumer over the next quarter? Right. And we're piecing together like really opaque insights. We get like a quarterly snapshot of one company's earnings, Discover Card. We don't really know the segmentation or mix of all the underlying sub archetypes and so on and so forth. And it's like from these snapshots, you're trying to piece together like what is going to happen to the economy. <laughs> Conversely, you know, if you're a company and you look at your data every day, it's pretty easy to see what's going on. Like, are my sales today falling off a cliff? No. How, what's actually changing in my business? Are people trying to renegotiate contracts? So we get a bunch of that kind of that level of insight and we just sum it up. And generally we just find pockets. So, like, you know, one of the most interesting things in the early days of our business is we live through COVID. And we had some major food delivery companies on HUM. And like one week into lockdowns, we saw that their revenue just exploded long before DoorDash announced er positive earnings. So in general, like if I sum up all the things we see, there's just pockets and shifting. Like you may have venture contract and private credit takes its place. You may have asset back lenders, you know, pause when like some particular kind of inventory is having a little micro crisis and um, other cash flow based lenders stand in to, to fill their place. That's happening kind of all the time. And then your big macro shifts end up being much shorter than you think. So most people don't know that, that in 08, the IPO window only closed for 90 days. Like that's it. 
so for the most part, if a business is clear-eyed about what its performance actually looks like, the macro environment doesn't really impact its ability to raise capital. It's just you have to have a much, much clearer picture of your performance and be able to communicate that to investors to get their attention. But if you're able to do that well, which is something we help people with, you know, you can basically have an all-weather fundraising. Right. But, you know, the, the ultimate success of your company, though, is going to be somewhat dictated by the success of the deals that you have. And I know you haven't been around that long, but I presume you've had some deals that have come come to a successful fruition, paid out on time or whatever. But what can you tell me about, about that and how much you're kind of... Like, if you have a 100% success rate, you're being too conservative, right? What can you tell us about that? Yeah, this is a great question. So so we don't take balance sheet risk. So they, sure. instead of thinking of, of us as like a big balance sheet, we got to make some bad loans to learn. Instead, think of us as a router to the whole network of commercial banks and private lenders that make up like 17 trillion of commercial credit that's banked in the US and 1.5 trillion of private credit. And so what, what actually happens under the hood is these are the people that are taking the risks. And what we find is there's a huge variety in how they act and operate. So some are hyper conservative, like loss rates are zero. Basically, they kind of try structurally to avoid any possible bad source of credit. Others are super risk taking. Some are so risk taking that they even blow up in cycles. It's just the normal market dynamic. It's just underneath this router where we're able to say, hey, work with this guy, you know, work with this guy. These are the three options out of, you know, 50 potential that are worth your time. Now, the thing that really drives our performance over time for sure is growth cycles. So if there's like a major contraction, you know, private credit just shrinks in a, in a whole year. That has an impact on our business. That's not dissimilar from trading volumes in a business like NASDAQ anyway. But, you know, in general, like the the economy is kind of over the long term up into the right. So we don't we don't spend a ton of time thinking about short term volatility. Right, right. Okay. So maybe last question then, where are you taking this? What's, what's your vision for the future of HUM Capital? So no bias in finance. If you solve <laughs> that problem, society will allocate its capital optimally, like as well as it can. If you solve that problem, then GDP growth is as high as it can possibly be. We know we're nowhere close to that, merely because of the prevalence of companies like FTX, Theranos, WeWork. Like the fact that those things even happen is clear evidence that we're not where we could be in capital allocation decisions. But if we get there to a better place in terms of more rigorous capital allocation, you know, GDP will grow faster, GDP per capita will grow faster, and all of the great things that happen when that happens, happen faster. Mm -hmm. So that's what gets us out of bed every day, that kind of long-term vision of a, a world that's more prosperous. In the short term, though, I mean, it's like at the, the micro level, like one customer by, by, by customer, kind of one at a time. I mean, we get to see entrepreneurs who are building their dreams come to us frustrated because they can't crack the market. And they, they're like, this doesn't make sense. I think my business is working. Like, why can't I get these people's attention? And we solve that problem for them. And they pour fuel on the fire and they achieve their dreams. And, you know, we have this, this saying that we have to remember, like, every company is someone's baby. Like someone gave birth to that thing mm -hmm. and they want to grow it. And often their personal identity is tied up in that thing being successful. And we take that super, super seriously. And it's a lot of fun to just like see people achieve their dreams. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it's a great place to leave it. Um, Blair, thank you very much for coming on the show. I hope uh, uh, you're able to fulfill all of the things you just said there. It's a, it's a big job you've got ahead of you. <laughs> oh, no, thanks so much for having me. If you like the show, please go ahead and give it a review on the podcast platform of your choice. And be sure to tell your friends and colleagues about it. Anyway, on that note, I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening, and I'll catch you next time. Bye.